Um, welcome everyone. We are still getting some attendees uh, coming, so I'm just waiting a little bit before we start. Just a few more uh, minutes. Um, okay, it seems like perhaps I can start now. Okay, so um, Welcome to this webinar. My name is Katiusia Casemiro. I am an editor for the Physical Review Journals. Uh, we are here today to have an interview with Ignacio Serac on his uh, hallmark paper, Two Qubits Can Be Entangled in Two Inequivalent Ways. Uh, before we start the meeting, I just want to make, make uh, one quick announcement. Um, sorry, okay. Uh, we just launched uh, one uh, new journal from the Physical Review family. So PRX Quantum is a topical journal for the quantum information science and technology communities. It's a highly selective open access journal and we are looking for research with, with, with an emphasis on lasting and profound impact. Um, I don't wanna take too much of your time with that. So just wanna uh, let you know that you can check details of the journal in our website. Also take a look in our list of board members. We are very excited to have um, several experts in the field uh, supporting the journal. And also be sure to benefit from the waived APCs through the end of 2021. So please check the website of the journal. Um, okay, concerning this meeting, uh, we are here today for the celebration of the 50th anniversary of Physical Review A. Uh, as you know, so 50 years ago, the Physical Review uh, was a split in pair uh, A through B, C, and D. And this gives rise to this uh, premier collection of a physics journal. Uh, in celebration to this anniversary, we are doing a few things this year. We have in our website a collection of milestones papers. Uh, every month we highlight, we pick from the past one of those papers and highlight in our website. So you can take a look on that. The Physics Magazine, they wrote a very nice article in which they also took uh, three of our milestone papers and they did an interview with uh, their authors and also uh, an interview with early career scientists asking their uh, view of those milestone papers and how they, it had an impact on their own research and so on. So it's a very nice uh, article to read. And finally, we are also uh, doing this webinar series. Today is the first one in which we bring one of the authors of this milestone papers here so that you can uh, talk about the paper uh, together with us. So um, today, as I said, we are going to start with uh, this paper from Ignacio Serrat. Uh, so that you know the, the format of this meeting, we will start with uh, uh, with a moderator having a conversation with Ignacio for about 20 or so minutes. And then we are going to open for questions, but you can start to type your questions at any moment. There is a question and a chat uh, window on the side in this GoToWebinar. So you can start typing in that at any moment but we are going to uh, call you uh, and read those questions in about uh, 20 or so minutes. Okay, so talking about our moderator, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Daniel Felinto, Professor Daniel. Um, he works in the University, uh, the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil, and he is a consultant editor for Physical Review A. And he uh, implemented in the lab several quantum information protocols. So he's here to help us with this interview. So with that, I leave with you, Daniel. Thank you. Okay. okay. Am I on? <laughs> okay. So thanks, Katyusha. So, 
and start. Okay, so it's it's really a great pleasure to have you today, uh, Professor Nasu Sirak, uh, to start our Behind the Research webinar series. Professor Sirak is a renowned researcher in the fields of quantum information, quantum optics, and atomic physics. He's currently the the director of the theory division of the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. And his work, I mean, has influenced enormous, enormously his field and physics in general. So as a theoretician, he introduced uh, seminal ideas that energize many areas around quantum information, fostering new lines of experiment. Uh, in 1995, for example, one of his famous papers introduced the core workable ideas on how to use ion threads for quantum computation, providing great infusion in both to this platform and I think for quantum computation in general. Nowadays we have systems. In 1997, another of his works introduced the ideas of quantum networks that which expanded in multiple directions, fostering experiments in from captive QED to atomic ensembles. And as another example, in 2001, he published a work on how to use Coulomb blockade Hindenburg atoms for various tests in quantum information, which led to a uh, I seem to be losing Daniel. Oh. Am I? <laughs> uh, should I continue or come back? <laughs> Katusia? Yeah, I, I can hear. I'm not sure if it's my problem or if it's with you. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm sorry. Inasio, are you hearing something? Yes, I'm, I'm hearing. So it, you, you, there was a, a brief interruption in what you were saying, but it was relatively short. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will continue then. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> so, I mean, I just quote a couple of examples uh, of his contribution, but this was almost arbitrarily chosen, I mean, for my personal view of the field. And there are many other examples, I think, like in uh, many body physics, and, and not even entering still in the fox of the present uh, discussion, which is quantum information theory. Eh? However, I want to point out uh, with these examples so far that, I mean, as an experimentalist myself, I think I'm always amazed uh, on how consequential a Cirex work uh, is to define actually the landscape of experimental activity in the field. And so our, our webinar series uh, is focused on particular articles published in Physical Review A that had great impact in, in its field. And Professor Sirke, I think, published in the year of 2000 a very special example of such article. Its title is Three Qubits Can Be Entangled in Two Inequivalent Ways. And he co authored the work with Wolfgang Durer and Guifrey Vidal. In this work, I mean, they showed that there are only two types of genuine tripartite entanglement among three qubits, in the sense that any pure state of one type. Uh, can be transformed you know, with some probability into another one of its of this type, but not into a state of the other type. You know? They identified a special representative of each of these types you know, of states, the greenberg horn zeilinger state, also known as GHZ state, and the W state. You know? Particularly, the W state was introduced in this work, coming out naturally from their analysis. You know? And to highlight the difference between this, these two types of states, the, the authors point out you know, that they react to the loss of, of its qubits in a totally different way. You know. The GHZ state turns into a separable state after losing qubit, while the remaining two qubits of a W state are still entangled. In the end, they discuss how these results will generalize to a higher number of qubits, you know, calling attention to the fact you know, that such an equivalence of quantum states would be considered the norm as its complexity increased. And at this point, I think it's important to recall 
I mean, the large influence of that many of Professor Sirik's work had in various fields to appreciate the fact that this article is among his three most technology were if its robustness immediately attracted experimentalists and is currently explored with many qubits, not only three. But I think and also crucial to, is the fact that many people really love the article, okay? Uh, because, I mean, it's very well written. I mean, its subject is quite abstract, but discussed, I mean, in a clear and precise manner, I was pondering with a lot of physical intuition. And now, I mean, we want to know more about it, and that's, that's why we are here, so we can start a, the interview. And I, I think I, I want to start by really the beginning, we are going to talk about quantum entanglement from now on. And the first sentence of the article is, the understanding of entanglement is at the very heart of quantum information theory. Thus, to start, can you summarize for us what's your present understanding of quantum entanglement? Did it evolve in this last 20 years? <laughs> Okay, well, first, first, let me start thanking uh, PRA and thanking Katyusha and Daniel for this very kind introduction and invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And let me also congratulate PRA for its 50th uh, birthday. It's a great, uh, wonderful journal. And I think that all the physicists working on quantum information have had uh, physical reviews, the main or one of the main journals. So it's very important for us, also in atomic physics. Thank you, Daniel, for your very kind and uh, introduction, and also for introducing the subject of the paper. Indeed, it's about entanglement, and entanglement is a property of quantum physics which makes it different from any other theory. So we have uh, classical physics in which you can have uh, several objects, and these objects may have some correlations. So whenever you measure one property of an object and you measure another property of an object, maybe they are correlations because they have the same origin. But in quantum physics, this, the, I mean, the mathematical structure that is behind the theory of quantum physics makes that these correlations can be of a special kind. So according to quantum physics, I mean, the properties of objects don't have to be uh, defined because they can be superpositions. And therefore, whenever, whenever I make a measurement, the result is not deterministic. And if you put together this superposition principle with the fact that you can have two or more objects, then naturally appears entanglement, which is, the property in which you can have superpositions with several particles in such a way, whenever you measure one, then actually the state of another one is determined. And these give rise to certain correlations which cannot be represented classically with what we call hidden variable theories. And this is what we believe that fuels quantum physics in order to process information, to transmit information in a very different way and it uh, has applications like quantum computing, quantum cryptography, and so on. But if you go back, it seems that everything is related to this property of, of quantum physics, which does not exist in our classical world, which is an entanglement. Okay, so thanks. Uh, but So now, what's your personal recollection on how the paper came about? Okay, it's actually, it's a, it's a, it's a nice story <laughs> behind that. And at the time, you see, this was the end of the 90s. And so people in the 90s were interested in quantum computing and in applications of quantum, uh, of quantum physics. And uh, the goal was, and from the theory side, to find new applications, but also to develop a theory on which these applications in the futures will be based on. So one can look at computers that we have on our desk now or the communication devices that we have. There is a mathematical theory which was developed 50 years ago, the theory of information. And what people wanted to do in theory is to develop the theory of quantum information or quantum information theory. And so for that, it was very well clear that entanglement should be what is very different from the classical theory of information. And therefore people try to uh, characterize it quantify it and so to try to, to, to see what how it appears in different systems. And there have been several papers on what happens if you have two systems and what kind of entanglement you can have there, and many papers about that. And whereas for three systems, there were some papers, and uh, but, but there were all these states like GHC state, there were product state, there exists certain kind of states, but it, the, the, the mathematical problem was very complex. 
And uh, so actually I can, I can trace back the, the original, uh, at least from my point of view, idea of this paper when I was in a conference in, in Seville, it was uh, around 98 or 99. And then it was Anton Zeilinger there, the C of the GHC. It was yeah. Arthur Eckert. I remember there were some other people I don't remember. We were sitting just discussing about uh, what was different with three particles than with two particles. So we can, can, it's only quantitatively different that we have more particles than it, or there can be some other kind of entanglement. And then, uh, so I remember that from, with my background in quantum optics, I had dealt with what people call decay states, which are these W states. Yeah. And then I raised this, this question of whether it can happen that the GHC state and W state are related to each other. And then there was some discussion. And then I flew back to, to Innsbruck. I was living in Innsbruck and in the plane, I wrote some equations to see whether they were the same or not. I talked to a master student and we found that they were not the same, but we parked the problem. We didn't talk, talk about that. So the, I mean, the, somehow the direction was a different one in, in quantum information theory. Until uh, then, uh, Gifre Vidal, actually Wolfgang Dürer was a PhD student and Gifre Vidal was a postdoc. And Gifre Vidal had been working on entanglement theory and Wolfgang Dürer also for his PhD. And at some point we recovered this problem. And then I told them, so there is these two states, we seem to be very different. But are there more? Are there not more? And there is where we started, just looking, okay, so let's look at them. And then we saw that actually we will have first to define so what is like what you call SLOCC. So how do we classify? We want to classify entanglement, we have to give the rules of the game. So part of the paper is about giving rules of the paper of the game to classify certain kinds of entanglement. The second is to show what are the classes of entanglement with three qubits. And the third one is to say, well, everybody knows this GHC state, but this W state is not so well known. So let's characterize it and let's look at the entanglement of this of this state. So this is what I recollect. So maybe I'm, I forget something important or somebody who was important, but uh, that's how I remember. But uh, I mean, what you recall as I think the main challenge that you, you faced during the, the work, I mean, when you, you built it, so the main the main challenge was to prove that there was nothing else. So you see, we had these two, and then we say maybe there are three or twenty or infinite different ones. And so the I think that the, the mathematical challenge was to say, okay, so these are the two, and there is nothing else, at least for three qubits. And so this is where we started thinking, and now not solving equations, not trying to brute force, but thinking in terms of some other methods which are detailed in the paper. Yes, showing that basically in the same way that in the two in the in the bipartite system there is something called the Schmidt decomposition, which gives you the rules about entanglement of two systems. Then with three, we could do something very similar and then see that actually the, there was no way that if you have like a, a superposition of two product state, you can transform it into three or vice versa with this information. Mm -hmm. And there cannot be four. So there are only the two, the three, and there that's it. So that was basically <laughs> the challenge. Okay. So, uh, what, what what surprised uh, you about the success, and how would you summarize this the success of this of this work? I mean, that's that's very funny because at the time, of course, we were writing many papers like everybody, and it was <laughs> difficult to see what was a paper that would have more or less impact. And now, looking looking back, I can see why this uh, paper had some impact. But at that moment. I mean, I, I, so we thought that it was a good paper, but it, we didn't see that. I mean, they were introducing some other measures of entanglement, some other things. I think that somehow what what uh, had to, what make it to have impact is a little bit the luck of just naming a state. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Have a state, and then you give it the name, and then when people use this state, give it a name inside your paper, now where you somehow i mean give this name and then i think that was and also this motivated people to say that there are two states so i mean then there are two different properties so i'll explore these two properties and then other people started looking at four particles or more particles then saying oh this let's look at these rules on the game and let's play these rules of the game so i think it has been cited or it had impact because of giving the rules of the game on of this particular game, which we call SLOCC classification, because introduction of this kind of W state and seeing that there is life beyond GHC state, uh, entangled pair state and bell state, there's a different kind of states. And then there are some technical details there. So it's certain proofs that I think that people later on use them in some other, in some other proofs. So the W state, uh, that 
really attract a lot of attention. I mean, mm -hmm. with various applications proposed for it. So nowadays, what do you consider to be its most, I mean, most important application, most interesting application? Well, I think that you, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning, it's a state that on the one hand is entangled. It can be shared by many particles. So it's not only three, you can have a million particles yes. entangled. And what happens is that if you lose one of them, then you don't lose the entanglement. So actually the, the entanglement that you lose is one divided by n. And in fact, you can see this, this state appears over and over in experiments. You, you mentioned that. So people that are entangling atomic ensembles, for example, where there are millions of atoms there, then they get one excitation, they get a click, and then they have this, this W state. So it appears that in a very natural way in some experiments in which you can detect one photon and then the rest is the post-selected state that you have is that is that that particular state. But I would say that one of the properties which at the beginning you see, I mean now we see it very clearly, but at that time it seemed that decoherence was the fight that we have to, mm -hmm. to have against uh, in order to have applications in quantum information. And it seemed that if you have entangled states and decoherence just kills you. I mean, you have a GHC state, which was a prototype type of a state violating kind of Bell inequalities, the state that people were using for applications. Mm -hmm. You lose one particle, it's gone. And then it showed that actually well, there are some other states that they, they I mean, entanglement is not, not gone. Of course, they may not be so useful as these other states, but there is mm -hmm. a trade off, trade, trade off to play. Okay. And so at the time, I mean, the, the article ended with various ideas on how the work would generalize to a larger number of qubits. I mean, how these ideas evolved, I mean, in the last 20 years in terms of properties of these larger entangled states. Yes, so we mentioned in the paper that in three qubits you have two classes and you have more qubits then there will be an infinite number of classes that will have to be con now classified with continuous parameters. You have, instead of three qubits, three three level systems or three four level systems, Q-treats or Q-treats, then, uh, then uh, there will be some finite classes, but when you increase the dimension, they will, be, they, they will increase. And so the, the way I see is that people started realizing that when you have many, many particles, the Hilbert space is enormous. So the number yeah. of, of, of coefficients that you have when you express your state in any basis, it grows exponentially with the size of your Hilbert space. That's taking it to our advantage in a quantum computer, but it's taking to our disadvantage whenever we want to do any classification or we want to talk about physical properties of states or classifying states or something like that. And that's why I think that uh, uh, people, I mean, did a lot of, of research on entangled state, but at some point they re also realized that all the states in Hilbert space actually are never reached by, not even by a quantum computer. So we always hear this statement that the Hilbert space is large. We have this two to the n, uh, the coefficients, these two to the n dimensions, if you have n qubits, and that we have many, many states and superpositions and a quantum computer exploits that. Actually, this is actually not true. What happens is that the quantum computer explores every corner of Hilbert space. So yes, the number of parameters, I mean, the scales polynomially with the number of qubits, and therefore you can explore only a polynomial side compared to the exponential. But what has been realized during the last years, I would say that exactly, you have this huge Hilbert space, but only the corner matters for everything, for quantum computation, for everything. And this is why people say, well, actually, I mean, the fact that we have that many parameters and it's very complex, maybe it's not so interesting. Let's not try to classify you know, entanglement in general. Let's not classify everything. Let's go to that corner of Hilbert space and let's try to identify and study entanglement. I think that this has been a motion which at the beginning, I don't think that it was predicted, but that, that has happened. And I think that this has been very positive because this has made connection now with condensed matter physics, which can make connection even with quantum gravity, if you want, with people working on tensor networks. And I think that uh, somehow this is, this is related. So now people are working on, you know, let's say, this classification for these states which are relevant from the physical point of view, for example. And I mean, now, I mean, that we passed 20 years né, from, the, from that art. Where do you see the research, I mean, the field of the paper going right now, I mean, and in the future? I mean, the, well, the... I think that it's, it, that's a, a brick in the whole wall of uh, entanglement theory. Mm -hmm. So, you see, I, I, I started uh, saying that we want to have a theory of information 
that would be the basis of the applications in the future that it's quantum theory information quantum information theory and this is not like relativity theory where there i mean einstein comes and puts just the stones and everything follows i mean this is made out of small things and i think that that's a brick in that wall and that's allowed to put some of the bricks and that's building that's building up it's probably one of the ones who are very low because there are many things going up and so i see it as a as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as some point at which allows to grow in other directions and there have been many of these of these papers I think that I put something that they have grown and now some of the things that we are looking at are probably because there are these papers they were these papers were written in the 90s and the 2000s and for the particular for this three qubit states do you think there are particular applications for this kind of multipartite states well people nowadays. well people people look at some applications so we know that ghc states can be used in some applications in communication complexity and they have been they have been papers in which they propose protocols let's say for quantum communication based on those on those states and uh, and so that it have, yeah they have they have some applications i wouldn't say that they're like at the level of quantum cryptography but there are some applications but i think that more than applications, but I would say that somehow what I'm interested in to, is to, 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 I mean, the, open up the possibility that there are things beyond GHC states, that they are okay. different, they have different properties. And therefore, this opens up other possibilities, mm -hmm. other states, and to look at different applications. And maybe the W states are not the ones that have most applications, but some mm -hmm. other states, I mean, there, I mean, after that, there were graph states, there were some other states which are important now in error correction, error correcting code, and so on. That the, that the peer states with different uh, with different applications. So I would say that the W is among one of those one of those states which show that it's different and uh, it's different. So you can expect different things than from the GHC state. So I mean, not a, maybe a more open question. I mean, we, we've seen them I mean, in the last uh, years. And various companies starting to invest in quantum computers né? Uh, with some commercial system available né? for four shots. Uh, but do these new machines, I mean, trying to quickly scale up their number of qubits, pose new theoretical questions in quantum information? Or do they differ considerably from the idea of quantum computer that was theoretized, I mean, previous decades? <laughs> Some... Well, okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the story that I have in my mind. So you look at 94, okay. 95, then people were thinking that a quantum computer is an ideal device which has gates, works, and that's it. Then uh, there were developing of algorithms, uh, physical implementations, and so on. And then you, you think a little bit about that. You say that things are not perfect in nature, so they will not work. And therefore, then there was a pessimism. All of a sudden, people started to say, well, this is not going to work. It's impossible. The, the coherence will kill everything. Until error correcting was error correction and tolerant error correction was developed and invented. And so I think that this showed that uh, apart from the theories developing quantum algorithms and applications for quantum information they should also help to scale up the devices so when we say that uh, quantum computer that google ibm or many other companies are building at the moment are is very small and it's a challenge to scale them up is not only a hardware challenge it's also a theoretical challenge because we have to get better error correcting codes other ways of correcting maybe adapting it to the to the platforms and so on. So I think that indeed now the, uh, I mean, the, the goal of building a quantum computer has different components. And one of them is to figure out what are the quantum states that are more resistant to noise for some particular kind of noise, for example. Mm. But so, probably, so these machines nowadays are quite different than from what were thought originally. <laughs> but uh, yes, and, so in and, your, mm. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, they are quite different now from what they were thought to be in the 90s, and in 10 years or 20 will be even more different, I guess. Be even more different. <laughs> and the the other area that uh, I mean started from from your work, the quantum networks. How you see it nowadays? Because it's expanding uh, quickly, man. Yes, yes, yes. So that was also something that was kind of a thinking. Ah, okay. So what? What uh, can we get entangled now that they are far away, and then use it and play with it, and 
and things like that. So we wrote a couple of papers on quantum repeaters and how to create them. And now, uh, well, I mean, that's, that's uh, one of the applications, I guess, of quantum information. So how to build, people call it uh, quantum internet. So, so we mm -hmm. at the end, so I always say like that. So at the moment, I mean, it's, it's very noisy, it's very difficult, it's very expensive. So you're not going to replace classical communication by quantum communication. But 20 years on the road, down the road, or 30 years, when the systems are less noisy, are economical, and if the prices at some point are similar to the prices of uh, uh, classical, then they will replace them because quantum is includes classical and is more powerful. So if the prices are the same, you will replace them. And so that's a little bit the thing that one had in mind, that maybe not now, but if, I mean, experimentalists make progress and at the end, then they will replace and so that's uh, that's why it would be interesting to have uh, the, some of the basic pieces. And then mm -hmm. what was very important, and it's behind all my work, is that when you have one of these ideas, then there are some experimentalists around, and then they sit down and they do it, and actually they do it better than what you thought, and then there are some other people thinking about that, and come up with many ideas, and at the end, the, the, the project flourishes. So again, that's, uh, I mean, it shows that nowadays, uh, research is a very colorative, a collaborative uh, yeah. enterprise, even though we don't realize, but that's really, uh, I mean, ping pong, you think something, somebody else thinks something, and then things add coherently. Yeah. So, so thank you, Sirik. I mean, Katyusha, do we have some questions already? Yeah, from yeah. The we have, we have. We Maybe have we can two people. Pass it in. <laughs> yes, so people like the idea of the corner of the, the Hilbert <laughs> space. So we had two questions okay. on that. So the first one is uh, if you can comment on what is the corner that we access with a quantum computer, which I think might connect to the platform, but I will leave to you. And the question goes on also to say uh, if. Uh, is the ground state of a Hamiltonian which follows the area law. So I think, it, yeah, how, how you connected this corner with a simulation of uh, the ground states of Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is a, this is a very active uh, area of research. So we know that there is a corner. So, and I mean, you can mathematically formulate and realize that the most of the Hilbert space, the zero measure part of Hilbert space is used. So the quantum computer or nature uses a very small, tiny set of states, let's say a manifold of states, very little, very little. And now, uh, so there are two, two puzzles there. So one puzzle is, okay, so if there is a little corner of Hilbert space, maybe we can uh, describe it efficiently. We don't need uh, exponential number of parameters. We can have with few parameters and therefore we can understand physics well with that. So we don't, uh, I mean, some of the problems when we study high energy physics or condensed matter physics that we have many particles and then we write wave functions this this size of the Hilbert space explodes however we were able to characterize this corner of Hilbert space and maybe we can understand problems in in, in physics so that's a that's a challenge and so this tells us okay let's try to find what is that corner of Hilbert space but this somehow uh, crashes against quantum computing because quantum computing it's using this corner of Hilbert space and it's doing things that we don't know how to do and we expect that we will not be able to, to, to know how to do. And that's a little bit the, the, the distinction that is somehow happening, that somehow we could say, that let's go to the next step and let's see. So we would like to know what is this corner of Hilbert space for the states that we want to describe in nature. For example, you have thermal equilibrium of a system, you have electrons moving in a solid and you would like to know at certain temperature or at zero temperature, what are the physical properties? And you have a, a, a state, a very entangled state that will be on the corner. And if you are able to describe this corner of Hilbert space, maybe you can have access to the study of this many body system that otherwise you cannot study with supercomputers. And that's what happens, for example, with the tensor networks. That's what they try to do to describe this corner of Hilbert space corresponding to equilibrium physics. So when systems are at that certain temperature. And that's related to the question that you were asking, Katusha, Katusha is the, this is related to area law. So in fact, uh, I mean, it's proven under different assumptions that if you have an area law. So if your state has, has a little entanglement, let's say, then it can be described, it's in this corner of Hilbert space and it can be described efficiently. In fact, I mean, it's, 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 uh, uh, the, the statement is even more general is that if your interactions are local, so like in all 
fundamental theorems that we have. You look at the standard model, all interactions are local, otherwise with violet causality. So if the inter interactions are local, then if you're in thermal equilibrium, then you will be in that corner of Hilbert space, which is described by little entanglement, and then there exists a description of this corner of Hilbert space. Uh, however, if you are not in thermal equilibrium, like typically a quantum computer is not in thermal equilibrium, then there will be dynamics, there will be a lot of entanglement, they still be in this corner of Hilbert space, but then we don't, we don't know how to describe this, these systems. So indeed, maybe now re replying to the question, sorry for being that long. Yes, for, uh, let's say, for ground states, an area law describes this corner of Hilbert space, and I think that there is a chance that we can understand this very well. For a quantum computer, there exists a corner, but we don't know how to uh, have a handle on it, and it's likely that we will not have a handle on it. Thank you. Uh, there is a question. I will change a bit subject. There is another question on the on the on the corners, but I will change a little bit. And it's uh, in connection to what the, the main difficulties in in having a quantitative measure of the tripartite entanglement and connections with uh, other types of uh, um, quantum correlation, so concurrence, other things that have been tried. So, yeah, if you can comment a little bit on this difficulty and and also connections as well with the uh, violation of local local realism mm -hmm. so, yeah okay okay very good so let me tell you a little bit about history again since this is about history and <laughs> history so uh, there was in the in the 90s there was uh, there was a very nice paper by several authors in which they basically showed that if you have two particles there is one kind of entanglement Right, only one kind of state. And then there is a measure of entanglement which describes these bipartite states. This is what we call today the entanglement entropy. And, uh, and so you have a bipartite state, then there is basically one way of measuring entanglement. However, you have you go to more than one particle, like three particles, four particles, and soon it appeared clear that there were different kinds of entanglement. And that depending on how you define it, then some states will be very entangled and some states will be very little entangled. For example, the GHC and the W state we are talking about. So if you look at something which is called a uh, tangle, then one of them has maximum tangle and the other one has a low tangle. And that's a measure of entanglement. And if you look now at some other quantity, like uh, so what is how much entanglement can you create in two particles by measuring the third, something which is called localized entanglement, then it's the other way around. So we realized, well, people realized very soon that there were very measures of entanglement. And in fact, the problem for some of them was mathematically very different, difficult. There has been a lot of progress during the last years, but I think that we still believe that there are many measures of entanglement. And so I guess at least my, my, my view is that now you should tell me what do you want entanglement for? And I will tell you what is the right measure of entanglement. No, we know that entanglement is a fuel Whenever you have entanglement, you can do something better. And there are many things that we could do better with entanglement. So depending on the one that you want to do, then there is a different measure of entanglement. And that's, I, get, I mean, I guess that this is a very practical point of view. You know, that's, uh, let's define the entanglement depending on what you want to you do, do with that. And even that, it's difficult. So at the end, it, I mean, it turns out to be a difficult problem. And so there are many people working on that. And uh, there are still many open problems even in that in the entanglement theory and now the relation with local realism is that okay so it was proven by Nicolacci already in 1991 or 1992 that whenever you have an entangled state then there are some measurements that you can perform that would violate some kind of inequalities or translating it to some other language is that the correlations given by any pure state that is entangled cannot be described by a local hidden variable model and so that's that's uh, I mean known from their, their their own, and therefore somehow the more you violate Bell inequalities, the more you cannot describe it in terms of local hidden variable model is also a measure of entanglement. So people have worked on this relation, and that's another active area of research. People call it non-locality. So how do you measure not only entanglement but the potentiality to violate kind of Bell inequalities? Thank you. I just have to say we have several questions. I'm trying to, to parse in here. I have to apologize for people if I if I uh, 
go over some, but I'm trying to choose different topics as well. Uh, so we have one question. I think it's quite interesting because you have worked uh, with qubits, of course, but as well with continuous variables. And the question goes on on how much the ideas uh, uh, in developing things for continuous variable, how much those ideas influence the work in qubits and vice versa. Actually, it's a very it's a very interesting question and very nice question. And in fact, there, you see, in continuous, so you can take let's take qubits, let's take Q-trees, or four level systems, five level systems. And then you go to infinite and then you go to continuous variables. That's one way of thinking about that. And that's because uh, it shows that continuous variables are very difficult. And however, within continuous variables, there are certain kinds of states which are uh, very natural. They appear very natural in quantum optics in, in experiments. These are called Gaussian states. And so these are states that somehow have, uh, uh, are the ones that can be created in the lab in a relatively simple way like squeeze states, coherent states, and things like that. So what people did from the beginning is to say, well, let's not consider just yes, this infinite uh, dimensional Hilbert spaces with, if, with many variables, because there are many possible states. Let's consider the ones that are interesting from the perspective of experiments, and these are Gaussian states. And now if you look at the Gaussian state, they have a description that even though they are continuous variables, they have a finite matrix description. So somehow you work with what is called covariant matrix, and which is just a finite matrix that depends on the number of modes that you have. And now there was there was there there are some similarities. If you have three qubits, it's like having three modes. If you have four qubits, it's like you have four of these modes, and you have a four qubits is a finite Hilbert space, then the four modes are described in terms of finite covariant matrix. And then people started just looking at what has been done with qubits and trying to see how to translate it to, to uh, continuous variables with covariant matrices. And actually we work on that and we were motivated by both cases. So for example, I can tell you that, I mean, we solve one problem of entanglement uh, characterization for continuous variables for these uh, states. And then we translated them to qubits and then solve some problem in qubits yes, by doing the translation of how we solve it. So they have been connected not only by us, but by many people, even though, I mean, these are different now. I mean, for the mathematically oriented uh, audience in one case, I mean, the, the, the mathematical structure about n qubits is a tensor product of Hilbert spaces, and in the other case, a direct sum. And uh, so that makes them very different, but still there are some similarities that could be exploited. Thank you. Okay, we have another question going back to yeah. non can, can. Oh. You have one, Daniel? Yeah, go on. No, I would just make one too. We can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can just, I just like to, to really give another one from, uh, I think, from Oliver Pister. Uh, it's again about the corner. I think you already mentioned it. Uh, could you please okay. elaborate on, on how exponential speed ups can be reached using only corners of the ribbit space? I mean, I guess this is a matter of circuit depth rather than width. And, and also, yeah, is the case of quantum simulation different? No, no. It's a, it's a very simple counting argument. You see, you have n qubits then you have two qubit gates and single qubit gates they are universal and then you want to do a polynomial depth circuit otherwise it will take an exponential time and you will not be able to do it in your lifetime let's say so you're limited to n qubits and let's say n square n to the cube gates now the number of parameters that you have will be n to the four it's polynomial what is the number of parameters that there are in the hilbert space is two to the n so you see that even the quantum computer which has a polynomial depth I mean, only explores, let's say, as this polynomial number of parameters. It's a very simple counting argument. What is nice, it's very interesting, is that already with this corner of Hilbert space, just exploring this, uh, this polynomial number of parameters still can do things that we cannot compute. And uh, that's what I was mentioning before, that that's enough. You don't need this exponential Hilbert space, but just with this polynomial number of parameters within a Hilbert space that is big is enough to do something that we cannot do with classical computers. Okay. Uh, yeah, I we have a one perhaps now going back to non-locality. So it's the following: the term correlations is ubiquitous when we describe entanglement and bound non-locality. What would you say about the new phenomenon of no input non-locality in this regard? There are no measurement choices. So where is the correlation? Do you think this is a new form of non-locality? No input non-locality. 
No, what was? No, no input, non-locality. Well, I'm I'm sorry, I cannot answer this question because I don't know what that is. I'm sorry, very sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, that is one very direct question, I think, for for people um, using the field. So, is that a general agreement on entanglement measure for pure states? And no, no, and that's uh, that's uh, what uh, what I mentioned before. That for bipartite systems, I would say that yes. So you have two, let's say, qubits or qtrees. Then I think that we communicate with each other very clearly. There is the entropy of entanglement. But if you have many many systems, then there are many ways of measuring entanglement. And I can tell you one. And you see, you can just take. Let's imagine that you have four particles. Then what you can do is to say, okay, let me cut put two on the left and two on the right. Now I have a bipartite system. The first part is composed of two qubits and the second part is two qubits. And now I can apply the entanglement measure of two qubits and this will give me a number. But there is another possibility in which you just separate them the other way around. And then you will have a different partition. And then you will have a different entanglement measure because maybe the particles were entangled along some directions but not along on, uh, the other direction. And now you can make many partitions and then you can I mean, just with different partitions, different kind of entanglement. And this is just one, this just illustrates why there are different possibilities of measuring entanglement. And then the people will give you different numbers when they refer to entanglement. And so there is not an agreement, but I think that there is an agreement that there are many entanglement measures. Okay. Uh, I make one have, question. Yeah, 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 go on. Uh, so, Sirik, uh, actually, there is a question here on classical correlation in quantum entanglement and how is it inside quantum entanglement and then i would just want to change a little bit the question how how do you see nowadays this discussion about the border of classical and quantum correlations do you think this is still a, a, a i mean a, a present day problem i mean nowadays we well, discuss so much quantum entanglement <laughs> Okay, that's a that's a good question. So there is there is uh, indeed there is a there is a boundary between classical and correlation. So I can give you some state, and it turns out that whatever you measure in that state, it doesn't if it's it's not pure. It's a mixed state, what you call a pink state. Then it will it will have correlations that can be described classically. Yeah. And now I can make it a little bit more pure or more entangled. And at some point I will cross this border, and there is this border, and this border can be characterized and can be characterized mathematically. So there is a, there is a, I would say, there is a way that if you give me a state, in principle, I can tell you whether it's on the side of the quantum correlations or on the side of classical correlation. However, that's an uh, NP-hard problem. So it's very difficult. So you have two particles, okay, you have many, then you will not be able to do it in practice. And so there have been now many works actually trying to uh, have different definitions. So imagine that you don't want to know on what side you are, but you would like to know how far are you from the border, and then you're given some conditions, and then this has given, given rise to a lot of a lot of papers and a lot of results on entanglement theory about that. But yeah, so I would say that there is an in principle way of defining classical and quantum correlations, but in practice, to find is a particular example is one way or the other and may be difficult. Okay, uh, we have one question on how to produce entanglement in a way, but more it's a theoretical question. So it's actually uh, about entangling gates and how you can have a maximally entangling gate if it swap gate is it's, it's a maximum entangling gate. And yeah. Oh, that's that's interesting. So there there was a there was a I mean in the early 2000s there were several papers about entangling powers of gates. Actually, we wrote some papers and some of the people wrote some papers. And then, so one of the results I think that came out at least for two qubit gates is that a two qubit gate has a universal decomposition. You give me a two qubit gate and I can write it in some standard form. And just by looking at the standard form, I can tell you what is the entangling power. And so it turns out that the uh, C naught gate, for example, which is a gate and the control C gate and maybe some other gates have exactly the same entanglement power. The Schwab gate, which is a different gate, will have a different entanglement power because if you just have the two particles, it cannot entangle at all. However, you use ancillas, you use locally entangled particles, and it will create two EBITs of information. So that's uh, uh, 
something that that okay so it was very uh, very well characterized i think in the in the year 2000 even people study what is the entanglement um power of a hamiltonian now imagine now that i don't have a gate but they have a hamiltonian interacting two or three particles or four particles so how fast can it entangle so how much can it entangle it's something that was addressed some years ago and the results from there have been now extended and actually they are used for example in the context of tensor networks to prove area loss i mean the question that was mentioned before actually i mean has been proved using techniques related to entanglement power of, of quantum gates and hamiltonians um, okay, we have another question that goes back to your career. Uh, it says mm -hmm. that you started in atomic physics and, and then you moved to quantum information theory. So it's a little bit of, a, is this a good starting point to start with atomic physics? But perhaps putting the questions different, what you do recommend as well for someone starting the career in this field right now? Well, there are many, many, many paths. So, I mean, I, I'm very happy that I started in atomic physics and this helped me a lot. And this helped me also to understand quantum information. So that was, uh, but there are people who study condensed matter physics and have, have a, div, a similar path, or there are people who are studying high energy physics and they have similar path, or there are people who are studying quantum information and they have a similar path. What I think that is very important, at least what I realized and with, with, with years, and I see also with my collaborators or students on, is that, Somehow what has changed uh, a lot from what we had in the 90s, in the 90s, quantum information was like a theory to describe quantum computers. Let's say this, tell me what is quantum information. I want to have a theory to describe quantum, so how to process and transmit information. Now it's very different. Now quantum theory, quantum information theory is the theory behind quantum mechanics. It's a theory that describes condensed matter physics, can describe black holes, can describe quantum black holes, can describe high energy physics can describe chemistry, quantum chemistry. <laughs> you read now papers in quantum chemistry, I mean, probably you, you see that in PRA, then they uh, talk yeah. about entanglement in the introduction. No, you they, uh, some other people talk about, I mean, go to PRB, and in PRB, now I guess that there are many, many papers that have in interaction the word entanglement. So quantum information entanglement has become a universal, a universal language. And the idea is that at the end, we are talking about the same thing, either in chemistry or in, condensed matter or in quantum computing is that we have this property of quantum mechanics that we have superposition you have many particles and then all of a sudden properties emerge that are very uh, peculiar and that you cannot have in our world and therefore this gives rise to properties in condensed matter physics which are a typical topological order whatever in high energy physics, they have rise to anomalies or things like that. In quantum uh, gravity, it gives uh, the paradox, the information paradox and so on. It's information theory, quantum information theory is behind. And I think that uh, one of the successes of quantum information that will stay for a long time, maybe even longer than quantum computers, is the language that it provided to physics. Thank you. Uh, I think we are approaching more or less the end of the meeting, so perhaps we take two or so more questions. Uh, so we have one that is that concerns citations of papers. So uh, how you feel, if, if you feel that the citations on your papers agree with your feeling of how important they are, or for example, is there some other paper that you feel is actually more groundbreaking than your most cited one? Well, this, this happens, this happens, and I think that it happens to everybody, and that you think that something is important, and then the uh, other people don't consider it to be important, or maybe you think that something is less important, and then, I mean, this happens often. But also, what, what has happened is that uh, sometimes it takes some time to, to, to be cited, uh, and uh, so to, to, to make impact, to, uh, for your work to make impact. And this, I mean, my personal, uh, experience on that is very strong so I mean there are papers that had impact from the beginning somehow and there are papers that they had absolutely no impact in many years and then all of a sudden there was an experiment and then the impact went up or I mean I worked I, I wrote papers on tensor networks which I thought that they were I mean I thought that they were very important and then they didn't have any impact and only in the last five years they had a, a lot of impact and so it took 10 years or 15 years even for that. So I would say that this is a combination. 
the combination. So, I mean, sometimes this happens that your impression is different from the rest of the people, and some other time is that it takes and that, that is the wrong time maybe for your for your people. <laughs> Okay, we have uh, again one going to this to the corner of the Hilbert space, and uh, if this has any connection to the coherence. Well, to the coherence or to coherence to the coherence. The co yeah. The coherence. Well, I think that uh, I mean this. I mean, typically we talk about the corner of Hilbert space of pure states. And even without the coherence, there is still a corner of Hilbert space. Now, you have the coherence, then you have to talk about mixed states, so density matrices. And then what happens is that there is a different corner of Hilbert space, but still a corner of Hilbert space. So in both cases, in the absence or in the presence of the coherence, there is a corner of Hilbert space. The number of parameters describing all possible evolutions that you can have in a lab only grows polynomially with the size of your system, whereas the Hilbert space grows exponentially. And that's a fact that it's in the presence of the coherence or in the absence of the coherence. Tanya, you have more questions there? Uh, no, I think I'm... So, uh, we still want to show uh, one more thing to everybody, but I think we are going to conclude here and uh, yeah, thank you so much for this interview, for talking about this uh, yeah. paper. Yeah, Thanks a really lot. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. And, uh, before, uh, and yeah, thank you everybody for all the questions. I know we missed a few, but uh, uh, yeah, sorry for that. I, I just want to show one slide if I can. I'm not sure. I think I need some technical. Okay. Uh, I, I will say it, I don't have the access to the slide right now, but uh, okay, I got it. It's here. Okay, so I just want to make everybody aware that uh, next week, next uh, Monday, we have another event from the Physical Review Journals. It's a journal club. It's an event. It's different from this one. It's not an interview. It's a recent paper. And the idea is pretty much like a journal club, but the presentation is given by one of the authors. So the author of the paper is gonna show it for 20 minutes or so, but we have all the other authors in the meeting and everybody's gonna be able to, to ask questions uh, with microphone and camera. We wanna have a very lively conversation. So uh, you can take a look and register for this event as well. And I think with that, we would like to conclude then. Thank you everybody. Okay. Thanks. Okay, Thanks thank a lot, Ignacio. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. 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 Okay. Thanks a lot, Katusha and Daniel. Uh, Thanks. Okay, it was thank a great you. pleasure. Good day.